I feel the need to begin today's sermon with an apology. I, I know it's not the first time, I know it won't be the last, but today's apology is for all of you who are not fans of the 80s. Um, I know there are some of you out there who just get tired of the 80s. I, I'm sorry, I can't help it. It seems to be my go-to. Uh, last week, it was the love boat. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure someone was able to name that tune in just one word. That was very impressive. This week, I have a new challenge for you to name that show. Are you ready? Let's see if I can do this. Making your way in the world today. Oh, that was so fast, Abby. I got to get to the end. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Right? You guys recognize that one? I don't know what it is about 80 sitcoms, but they seem to have this ability to really speak to who we are as human beings. Because isn't that true? Don't people want to go somewhere where everybody knows their name? People want to be known. They want to know that someone cares about them, that someone misses them. Of course, what is already a basic human need becomes a million times greater when you come to faith in Christ. For as followers of Jesus, we are designed for fellowship. This isn't a word we use a lot outside of the church, it seems strange for the less church, kind of on that same topic of, of things that people who are not as familiar with the church find a little strange. The word fellowship may seem a little strange, but regardless, what it means is something that everyone can relate to, something all of us desire. Google defines it as friendly association, especially with people who share one's interests. And Google isn't too far off here of the biblical concept that comes from the Greek word, which is koinonia. And koinonia comes from another Greek word, koinos, which simply means common. And what koinonia describes is close mutual relationships. Close mutual relationships. I would say, if you look at Google's definition and the biblical definition, that Google represents a little more of our culture, and really our culture, when it comes to this concept, fellowship is more general, it's more detached, it's more self-focused. It's about me meeting my needs. In the Bible, fellowship is intimate, it is close, it is mutual. Isn't that what people long for? I see it all the time at Starbucks. Mind you, not everyone is looking for fellowship at Starbucks. Um, there are some who have their heads down very, very strategically. They avoid all eye contact. They don't want to look at you. They don't, don't talk to me. I just want my coffee and I want to get out of here, right? You, you know some of those people. Or they'll even sit down, but but they have as much space as they can between you and them. I actually, I, I had a funny experience this past week. On, I usually do my commentary reading at Starbucks. Keeps me awake as I'm reading my commentaries. Um, I, I love reading commentaries, but they do cause me to doze at times. Um, so it's, ever since I've done this, I've done pretty well with my reading. But uh, there was a chair... Uh, where a guy was sitting and one next to him on the other side of the table, those comfy chairs, I like the comfy chairs, I, I will confess. And um, there was a guy sitting in one and, and he kind of had his body turned so his legs were going across almost the front of the other. But everyone knows, right, in Starbucks that each seat is available. You know, you, you share these, you sit, you know. And so I asked him, as I always do, in fact, I remember one time, one guy got mad about people saving these seats. He doesn't ask people if there's an empty seat, he just sits there. But I like to ask, I like to say, is, is this seat taken? And the funny thing is he paused for a moment before answering me, and he had just the dirtiest look on his face, like I had just really ruined his day, and I'm standing there and, no. 
I said, okay, well, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit here. But I really, he never said a word to me. He was, he was very much like, I don't want to talk to you or have anything to do with you, which, which, is, which is just fine. But there are others who go to Starbucks, and all the workers know their names. Have you, by the way, do we have any of those people in here? Raise your hand. Okay, I, I admit, there, there, there is one guy in Starbucks, kind of funny, he, he knows my name. Every time he, I come in, he greets me, Dan, and he, he knows me. But the rest of them don't know me, so I must not be that bad. Um, but there are some people that they just, they want to be known. They want the employee, and you know they tell the Starbucks employees, get to know the customer's names. Because people like to be remembered. They like to be known. They like to believe that they're part of something that is bigger than themselves. But the thing is, we really have these conflicting desires when it comes to fellowship. We want to be known, but on the other hand, we're a little afraid. A little afraid that if we get too well known, things could get messy. You know, when you get too involved in relationships, things get messy. People might expect something of me. You know, I might be held accountable to something. So we have this conflict within ourselves. We like the fellowship, but we prefer the anonymity. And by the way, if you want to know why churches like ours tend to struggle to get beyond the size of our church is because more and more people in our culture are longing for anonymity. And it's true in church as well. They want to go to church, get their spiritual fix, and then go home. Maybe greet a person on the way in, greet a person on the way out, but I don't want it to get messy. And believers, I said this, especially I think it was last week that I was focusing on the belong challenge and saying that I, I just I, I can't square that with the Bible. I mean, I get it. I totally get it. But what is described in Scripture is relationships. I understand completely. Thank you. <laughs> <Where is some? laughs> um, what, is, what is communicated to us in Scripture is relationship, is that we are part of a family. And, and, and that's what it's all about. And by the way, that's why I love to hear, well, I love to hear all those Little squawking voices that were going on during our, uh, whenever it was, offer to, I love to hear those little voices. You know what? They remind us that we're part of a church family. Uh, we don't have a target audience here at Retton Bible Church. You may not know that lingo, but there are churches that say, what is your target audience? We have no target audience. We have no age group, no specific skin color. We're not saying, please come here if you're like this. Uh, our target audience is anyone who wants to come and learn about Jesus. And that's why I'm so glad that all of you are here today. But beyond learning about Jesus, my challenge to us is this, that to really learn and grow in Christ requires fellowship, koinonia, close, mutual relationships. And by the way, folks, that takes investment. It takes investment, and it can be a little scary for some. So some, some are just like, hey, you know, how are you doing? I want to get to know you, and I'm all, you know. Others are like, just, just you know, give me my space. We're talking about that in Sunday school this morning as well. But here's the thing about true biblical fellowship. It always costs us. However, it is also the only kind of fellowship that reaps real fruit in our lives. Anonymity will not reap the fruit of the Spirit in your life. If you treat the church as a place where I just come to get my spiritual fix, you're not going to grow significantly because guess what? We grow together. Growing together. That's what's described in the Bible. That's how the Christian life works. We grow together and therefore then we bear fruit together. It's what we are designed for. All people are made in the image of God. And therefore, all people are designed for fellowship. Why? Because our God is a God in fellowship. The Holy Trinity, three in one. It should come as no surprise then that we who are made in the image of God should long for such fellowship ourselves. So why don't we experience 
this kind of fellowship that's described here? The, the one simple answer is sin. We talked about this morning already. Sin has perverted God's design, wreaking havoc on fellowship. We see it in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve's decision to sin against God wreaked havoc on their relationship with Him. And we see it in the very next chapter, Genesis 4, in Adam and Eve's progeny, Cain and Abel, right? Sin wreaked havoc on their relationship, especially for Abel, who was slain by his brother. And sadly, we see the ramifications of sin in terms of broken relationships all around us. However, central to the gospel is the good news that Jesus came to reconcile us one to another, to enable us to experience anew the very fellowship for which we were designed. We see it powerfully taught in Christ's final words to His disciples in the upper room in John 17 where He prays. He prays for you and me. Did you know that? That Jesus prayed for you. Specifically, in John 17, he says, I pray not only for you, talking to the disciples who are with him in the upper room, he says, I also pray for those who will believe in me through your testimony. That's us. He prayed for us. And what did he pray for us? What are the last words that Jesus gives in John 17 before he is arrested and crucified? He prays that we might be one just as he and the Father are one. He wants us to experience the fellowship of the Godhead, of being part of His family. Why do you think that Jesus chooses this to be the topic of His final words to His disciples? Well, it's obviously important to Jesus. In fact, if you read the Upper Room Discourse, John 13 through 17, in its entirety, entirety you will see that fellowship and love are at the center of Christ's Final message for his disciples. But why pray for it? Why does Jesus pray for it? Because Jesus knew that it don't come easy. We, we struggle with experiencing divine fellowship. Love is hard. Fellowship is costly. However, if we count ourselves followers of Jesus, heirs of the kingdom of heaven, then the one fruit more than any other that should be evident in our lives is love. If you were here with us last week, you will know that this sermon is actually part two in our attempt to understand and embrace the fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Last week in Galatians 5, we saw that love is both preeminent and essential to our faith. This week, we are going to go deeper, making use of the book of the Bible that says more about love than any other book for its size. You know what that book is? 1 John. 1 John is all about love. And that's the very verse that uh, John read his scripture reading from this morning during our worship. It's, it's the book from which we received our communion meditation. But this morning, we are going to dive into 1 John. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John. Uh, you'll find it if you go all the way to Revelation and then back up just a couple pages, you'll get to 1 John. Uh, I also want to invite you to take your sermon outlines from your bulletins. If you didn't receive one of these, just raise your hand and Ragesh will make sure that you get one. As we begin this morning, I would like to return for a moment to the scripture reading that John shared with us during our worship time together this morning in John chapter 1, verse 5. Follow along as I begin reading a couple verses here. John 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you, God is light, in Him there is no darkness. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son purifies us from all sin. Here is an oddity. As John describes the results of Jesus' sin-conquering death, he includes both walking in the light and having fellowship with one another. Do you see that in verse 7? 
Here we see a huge difference between religion as it is practiced in our culture and religion as it is taught by Jesus. Religion in our culture, even Christian religion, is so often viewed as something that is private, personal, something we do in isolation. Believers, that is not the faith we find in the Bible. Christian love and fellowship is part and parcel with what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You cannot separate personal spirituality from its ramifications interpersonally among members of the body of Christ. Love is a necessary fruit of the Spirit, or as commentator of old Barclay says, Christian love springs to life when Christ is incarnated again in a man or woman who has given himself or herself absolutely to him. It is Christ in us that is the source of Christian love. It is his spirit inside of us by which Christian love springs to life. Or in the language of 1 John, love and fellowship naturally results from those who are walking in the light. It is for this reason that John goes on to write in 1 John 2, so if you'll go to the next chapter, verses 9 through 11, 1 John 2, 9 through 11, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother, is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. This is a pretty strong statement if you think about it. If you claim to be in the light but hate your brother... You are in darkness. But it coheres well with what we considered last week in Galatians 5, where Paul writes that those who live in hostility, discord, jealousy, angry outbursts, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, he says those folks will not inherit the kingdom of God. However, John's words in this regard are only going to get stronger as we continue on, turn to chapter 3 and look at verse 10. John says, This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Now, if you're paying attention, those are some pretty heavy-duty words. If you do not love your brother, you are not a child of God. John isn't one to mince words too much, is he? he? He tells it like it is. He says, those who do not love their brothers are not only not children of God, but they are children of the devil. As I mentioned last week, John is not arguing that a single unloving word or deed will send us to hell. What he is saying is that those who allow such sinful patterns to go on without repentance should think twice about where they stand with God. You know, we talk a lot about people feeling secure in their salvation, being secure in their salvation. The Bible tells us about a group of people who should not be secure in their salvation. And it is those who do not love their brothers. We find it in James, we find it in John, we find it in Paul's writings. All three of them say, listen, if you profess to be a follower of Jesus, but you don't love your brother you should be concerned about where you stand with God. You really should. And that's John's simple message to us here. What he is saying is that those who allow such sinful patterns to go on without repentance should think twice about where they stand with God. What does this mean? Thankfully, John does not leave us on our own to figure out what this means. Instead, he illustrates his point with a couple excellent examples, beginning with the negative example of Cain, and that's your first outline point you see there. So John says, okay, let me tell you what I'm talking about. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. 
Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. I think he got that from Jesus, if you'll remember, in the Sermon on the Mount. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. A lot of similarity between what John says here, what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, what Paul says in Galatians 5, they all cohere together quite well. He says, do not be surprised if the world hates you. Why? Because hate is the status quo in our world. But wait, Dan, aren't people basically good? Do you hear this a lot? Let me see. How many atrocities were committed this week? Even since I finished writing my sermon on Thursday, there are yet even more atrocities. Are we all basically good? Now, what we like to say is, oh, those are really wicked people. Those are the really bad, bad people. We're basically good. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one good, not even one. Romans 3. No. People are not basically good. People take after our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve, who, when God said, this is the path to blessing, said, no, God, we think we have a better way. We like this fruit over here. We're going to choose our own path. And guess what? Men and women have been choosing their own path ever since. We occasionally give a nod to God, but we live life our own way, and, and that's the definition of sin, living life my way, doing what I want, ignoring the God of all creation. The Bible says that people are not basically good. They are basically selfish and sinful. Certainly, we see glimpses of good in people, and that reminds us that we are all created in the image of God. We see glimpses, but the advent of sin and its ramifications on our relationship with God and each other in Genesis 3 through 4 expresses itself every single day in our world. But this is not, this is not the reality for those who have passed from death to life. Look at verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because, as opposed to the, the hatefulness in the world, we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. In the words of British theologian Christopher Wright, Christian love is a matter of life and death. It's as serious as that. It's what proves you have passed from one to the other. Again, if we, as we said many times, you don't earn God's favor by doing good deeds, but good fruit is proof that you belong to Him, that He is working in your life. If God is working in your life, it's going to bear fruit. That's where the fruit of the Spirit are all about. Listen, there are all sorts of people who profess to follow Christ, but John makes clear that the proof is in the pudding. Those who are genuinely alive in Christ genuinely love one another. As Wright goes on to say, faith in God through Jesus and love for one another as Christians, these two hang together. Our eternal life is received by faith and demonstrated by love, which brings us to the positive example, which is Christ. Follow along as I continue here in 1 John 3 and verses 16 through 20. 1 John 3, 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Let me pause for just a second and say, many of us have John 3, 16 memorized. Great verse to memorize. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. There's another great verse in 1 John 3.16, as we see it here. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us, 
and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. He goes on to say, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in His presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and He knows everything. Now, I have to pause here and say that there is a song I love from my youth. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. No more singing this morning from me. But it quotes the end of this passage. It's a great song from a group I loved in my youth. But I'm afraid that it muddles the message of 1 John a little bit. And by the way, once in a while, Christian songs muddle the message of Scripture. You have to be careful to listen to what's being communicated. But the, the chorus of this song says, God is greater. He comes to you as your Savior, greater. And even if your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. Now, there's nothing wrong with that lyric. The only problem is they're quoting from 1 John, and they leave out of this song a very important element. They leave out of this song the basis for our confidence when our hearts condemn us. Do you see what it is here? Look back in this passage. What is the basis for our confidence when our hearts condemn us? By the way, we all face condemnation at times. We all at times have our hearts saying, oh, no, God doesn't love you. You don't belong to him. Do you really think he cares about you? We all experience that. So maybe if you're thinking, well, I thought I was the only one. No, we all experience those kinds of doubts. But John says, whenever you're experiencing that kind of doubt, what does he say here? He says, there is a way for us to have confidence in knowing that we are loved by God. And what is the basis for this love? We find it here in 16 through 20. He says, dear, verse 18, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth. How do we know that we belong to the truth? When we love in action. Not just saying, I love you. Anyone can say, I love you. Those words are so overused. But John says, when we really love each other, that reveals that we belong to Jesus because only Jesus can supply that kind of love. And if we belong to Jesus, then guess what? We have confidence no matter what our hearts tell us. We can say, oh, Jesus, my heart's condemning me, but I know you accept me because I belong to you. I'm part of your family. This is the basis, however, of our confidence. Our confidence is, again, in verse 18. Let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in deeds. Do you know what we call loving only with words or tongue? Lip service. I cannot help but think of the experience that our family had in Minnesota, where one of the founders of the church I pastored there, by the way, can I just say, Minnesota is a great state. I, I, you know, Minnesota is wonderful. I do this just for the Stellingworths who are from Minnesota, because I don't want them to feel bad about Minnesota. There are great things about Minnesota. It's certainly not the mosquitoes. It's not the weather either, really, because it's really hot or it's really cold. There are great things, however, about Minnesota. I'm going to think about that for a while. And I'm going to share, share later about the great things about Minnesota. But anyway, back to Minnesota for a second. Wait a second. Okay, the fishing in Minnesota is really good. I loved fishing in Minnesota. Oh, and we had some great friends from Minnesota, including the Stellingworths. Okay, back to the sermon here. Um, one of the founders of the church there in Minnesota told me before I begin, he said, Minis, this church is the most loving church you'll ever experience. That's what he tells me just as I'm starting my ministry there. Within less than two months, I would see this loving church put on the ugliest, most unloving display I'd ever seen in the church, maybe in my life. I mean, it was ugly. And yet, I remember the man telling me, this is the most loving church. It's one thing to say you're loving or that you love the church, even if it's accompanied with seemingly self-sacrificial acts. So we give lots of money or we do this or we do that. But true love 
is not about nice sentiments or good deeds. It is about responding in love when times are tough. Do you want to know if someone's loving? Let them face a trial. Let them face someone who's unlovely or unlovable. Then you'll find out how loving they are. It's easy, as Jesus says, to love people who love us. That's easy. Anyone can do that. Love those who are not loving you, and you will demonstrate the reality of love. In those circumstances, true love is revealed. What does such true love look like? Well, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, doesn't he? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. Great passage of what love really looks like. And Paul's point is, don't talk to me about love. Show me love. Show me how you love each other when times are tough. And I I don't think it's a coincidence that he starts off with, love is patient. (laughs) It's long-suffering. I like that word. In other words, it puts up with a lot of junk. That's what love is. Powerful, powerful thoughts. If we would be loving, it must be more than lip service when everything's hunky-dory. It must reveal itself in patience, perseverance, long-suffering. John's message here is that when we display this kind of authentic love, then we know we belong to the truth and are children of God. Why? Because this kind of love only comes from God. We don't have the power within us to love this way. It's simply not there. Sin precludes us from that. But if we are forgiven and if we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, in other words, God's Holy Spirit lives in us, then we see the fruit of the Spirit and very top of that list of fruit is right there, love. If God's Spirit lives within us, it will reveal itself in the way that we love each other. Jesus not only provides us with the great example of genuine love, it is only through faith in Jesus that we're able to display genuine love. He's the source of that love. We continue in verses 21 to 24. Dear friends, in our hearts, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we obey His commands and do what pleases Him. And this is His command to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as He has commanded us. Those who obey His commands live in Him and He in them, and this is how we know that He lives in us. We know it by the Spirit He gave us. Do you see how all of this is intimately and inextricably tied together? Blessings come from obedience. But obedience begins with believing in Jesus Christ and choosing to love one another. And it is not a love that we have to drum up or manufacture. It is a love that is born out of our shared relationship with Jesus. And how are we able, empowered to display such love? Through His Spirit that lives within us. Love is the first fruit of the Spirit. More on that in a moment. But look again at verse 23, if you would. Verse 23 says, And this is His commandment to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as He commanded us. I return once again to British theologian Christopher Wright, who writes, Notice that John says this is His command, singular. But then he goes on to state two things. We are commanded not only to believe in the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, but also to love one another. And together they are one integrated command. If you do the first, believe, you will do the second, love. If you aren't doing the second, loving one another, then you aren't doing the first, believing in Jesus. Don't try to split them, for they are both the single command of God, believe in Jesus and love one another. They go together. So, Love for one another is not only the evidence of the life of God within us, it is also the evidence of the faith through which we came to receive that life in the first place. James said that faith without deeds is dead. John would agree by saying that faith without love, love that is proved in good deeds, is also dead. Nothing but an empty claim. In fact, since this is his command, it follows that if we aren't showing practical love for one another, we are simply disobeying the commands of the Jesus we say we believe in. 
And what kind of disciple are we then? That's a powerful point he makes at the end there. If we aren't loving each other, we're disobeying Jesus. And therefore, how can we call ourselves his disciples if we do so while refusing to repent? You see, once again, my point is not that we're going to never do something unloving. Trust me, I say or do unloving things once in a while. Please, no amens from the front row here. Um, Once in a while. The point is not that if you occasionally are unloving that God is rejecting you. That's not the point. The point is if you consistently display unloving behavior and if you refuse to repent when you're called upon, when a brother or sister says, hey, that's not, that's not of Christ. If you refuse to repent, then you need to think twice about whether or not you belong to him who you profess. But all of this is intimately connected. The disciple of Christ sees the law of love not as something that is optional, that we can take or leave, but as something that is integral to authentic faith in Jesus. Let's go back to verse 24 for just a second. Those who obey His commands live in Him, and He in them, and this is how we know that He lives in us, we know by the Spirit He gave us. Just as faith in Jesus and love for His people cannot be separated, so too obedience to Jesus and the empowering presence of His Spirit in our lives cannot be separated. Listen, if we are all honest, we must say that we all fall short of the law of love. All of us. We do. But this is where the good news comes in. The good news is that Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law of love through His death on the cross. Perfectly fulfilled in laying down His life for you and me. It's what we read about earlier in communion. By the way, we could spend weeks just on the few verses I read this morning in our communion meditation. But I want us to focus for a moment simply on verse 9 of chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 9. This says, This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. So that we might live through Him. Believers, to love, to truly love selflessly and sacrificially is beyond our capability. But in Christ, all things are possible. Amen? Which means He is not only our positive example, He is the power of love by His Holy Spirit that dwells in us. How is it possible for us to exhibit a divine love? Only because of the divine presence in our lives. Verse 12. And what is the nature of the divine presence? The Holy Spirit, verse 13 of chapter 4. Again, love is the fruit of the Spirit. The implications are powerful. First and foremost, if you would experience this kind of love, you must place your faith in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins to receive the Holy Spirit. If you've not yet done this, I would love to talk to you today. So how about we who do have the Spirit? Do we just hang out and wait for the Spirit to grow the fruit of love in our lives? Do we just do nothing but simply wait for Him to work in and through us? For this dilemma, we return to the great British pastor, John Stott, who has some great words in this regard. He says, It is a great mistake to suppose that our whole duty lies in passive submission to the Spirit's control, as if all we had to do was to surrender to His leading. On the contrary, we are ourselves to walk actively and purposefully in the right way. And the Holy Spirit is the path we walk in as well as the guide who shows us the way. And he's referencing here Galatians 5.25 where it talks about if we would walk by the Spirit, we must what? Keep in step with the Spirit. We have a part to play. So let's consider how we can keep in step with the Spirit with regards to this first fruit of the Spirit. I offer three applications, the first of which is that we must choose to belong. We've already talked about this, one of our four challenges from our Growing Together campaign. Believers, this is foundational to growing together. You cannot grow together in the body of Christ 
if you do not belong to the body of Christ. Again, I'm not talking about church attendance. I'm talking about church belonging. I'm talking about family. Listen, that song can seem overly sentimental. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. It sounds a little nostalgic. But the truth is, knowing each other's names is kind of basic to being part of the church. Isn't it? And I said it earlier. I mean, that's why we ask for those cards to be filled out. Not because we're selling your information anywhere. And we don't send out a lot of emails. It's mostly because we want to know your name. We want to know you. Because we know that you can't really be a family if you don't know your name. It'd be like if I walked up to my son and my daughter and said, Now, you look very familiar. Who are you again? No, I know their name. It's, it's part of who I am. It's, it's on the edge of my tongue all the time. I know who they are. Do we know each other? Do we know each other's names? Now, if you're brand new to our church, you're not going to know a lot of names. But here's the thing. Some people stay brand new to a church for a year or two years or three years, and they're still going, now, who are you? <laughs> and people are saying to them, now, who are you? <laughs> Believers, we got to know each other's names. How do you do that? Do you sit down with a directory, a picture, and, and memorize it? No. You, you come to our fellowship time at 10 a.m. next Sunday. And you come every Sunday, not at 10.30 just for the service, but at 10 a.m. so you can get to know people's names. So you can hear their stories. They can hear your stories. You can have relationship. I mean, that's, that's why we do these things. That's why we have this fellowship time. It's so that we can grow in fellowship with each other. And it's part of belonging. And there's a lot of other ways that we do this in our church as well. And I'll let you imagine those. There's a lot of different things. But... I mean, one is simply, it's okay to linger. Are you a lingerer or are you an out the door? And sometimes we just, we have something to do. I got to get somewhere. I got to go. So it's like, hi, Pastor Bye, and I'm out. And that's okay. Or maybe some of us, honestly, we're just not wired for those kinds of things. We just like, I need my space. I get that too. But my challenge to you is linger a little more because it's in lingering that relationship happens. We live in a world that we're, we're too driven by agendas. And when we're driven by agendas, we don't see people. We don't see each other. You're just, you're not a person. You're just in my way. Would you move <laughs> so I can get where I'm going? Oh, sadly, I'm convicted just saying those words. Believers, we need to belong to each other. And we need to serve one each other. And that's, that kind of even goes back to so often we're driven by our self-serving agendas. I have my agenda. I got to get my agenda done. I'm going to serve me. Believers, we need to learn to serve each other, to say, what's your agenda? How can I help you? How can I encourage you? Or even when we get together, with, you know, serving at Vacation Bible School, in part, that's just serving people. That's just serving the people who are coming to our doors. That's just serving the ministries of the church. We need to serve if we would choose to belong, if we choose to be a part of the body. And one, uh, by the way, I, and I, uh, one last word of encouragement to you regarding belong before I get too far along here is maybe have a barbecue or two this summer. Invite some people over from our church to get to know them. Just an opportunity to have some fellowship. Okay, I skipped that. So back to serve. Serving is good. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 again comes to mind. Loving when it's not easy. That's, that's the most powerful way I think that we serve each other is when we show love to each other when it's not the easiest things to do. It's easy, I think, sometimes for us to say, I love God's people. It's a whole other thing to show love when it's difficult. And so I want to read, and this is short, our time is about to conclude, but I love these words. Great wisdom from Jerry Bridges. And by the way, Jerry Bridges, in this book, The Fruitful Life, apropos to our sermon series, he's actually quoting from himself in the pursuit of holiness. Some of you read that classic 30 years ago, but he quotes from himself here, and it's a great quote about what love looks like. He says, suppose you were meditating on 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter. As you think about the chapter, you realize the importance of love, and you also see the practical outworking of love. Love is patient and kind and does not envy. You ask yourself, am I impatient or unkind or envious toward anyone? By the way, we should always ask ourselves questions like that when we read God's word. We should always be asking questions, how am I doing at this? As you think about this, you realize you are envious toward Joe at work, 
who seems to be getting all the breaks. You confess this sin to God, being very specific to name Joe and your sinful reaction to his good fortune. You ask God to bless him even more and to give you a spirit of contentment so that you will not continue to envy Joe, but will instead love him. You might memorize 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and think about it as you see Joe at work. You even look for ways to help him. Then, and this is the important part, you do the same thing tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day until God changes your attitude toward Joe. And believers, if we would love those that we find a little more difficult to love, it takes discipline. It's not just the God, forgive me and help me to love this person on day one. It's doing that on day two and day three and day four and day five. It's disciplining ourselves through prayer, memorizing an appropriate scripture, or just praying for Joe, looking for ways to serve them. I appreciate this wisdom. So if we would demonstrate this fruit of the Spirit, we must choose to actively do it. We must choose to love. Let's pray. And Lord, it's our desire more and more to see this fruit displayed in our lives. God, you know what we need. You know where our struggles are, where our shortcomings are when it comes to love. But God, we want to be more like you. Jesus, you gave us the example. Help us to follow your example and also to let your spirit more and more be expressed in our lives as we bear this fruit in the way that we love each other in the way we love you. And we pray it all in the precious name of our Savior. And all the people said, amen. I invite you to stand for our benediction. And our benediction this morning comes from, again, a very appropriate book to talk about love, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And this is how Paul concludes this great book. He says, finally, brothers, goodbye. Aim for perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss or hug. All the saints send their greetings. And he concludes, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen? Amen. Amen.